Well, we're so glad to have on our call today, uh, Ruth Tucker, who's dialing in from Zambia. If you're following her in the handbook, she's day five, page 27. And we're just so glad, Ruth, you're here in your own classroom. Yeah. All across the Atlantic. Say hi to everyone. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. We have a couple questions for you as we um, uh, yeah. work through. Thank you for the uh, your contribution to the video that you um, <laughs> that that you participated. Can you tell us um, about some of your personal interactions with the first grade students in the boarding school? Sure. So I'm the primary, uh, well, the only first grade teacher at the school. It's a small school. Um, we only have grades one to nine. And um, so I'm the only first grade teacher. And so my interactions with them are for all subject areas. Um, I do reading, writing, math, phonics, um, science, social studies, and Bible class all with them. And then I also help with the second grade students because we don't have a second grade teacher at the moment. And um, I teach all their English language arts classes um, in second grade. So my interactions are um, on an academic level. Uh, then we have after school activities, which I plan um, in terms of just uh, games and um, supervision. And then we also have weekend responsibilities. So the interactions go from like a parental role to a academic teaching role. <laughs> very good, very good. Can you tell us, Ruth, uh, some of the uh, challenges uh, that face these uh, uh, children in coming to know the Lord from your experience? I would say um, our students come up from all around Zambia. So our school is located in a very rural area, but our students don't come from within the community. Their families actually send them here from around. So mostly from cities um, and they're seeking that um, close, um, small school interaction, but also they, most families are asking for the biblical teaching part of it. Um, so if they come from families that are believers, I think the challenge is like with most um, children from Christian homes, um, they have to get past their knowledge. Um, they have a lot of background knowledge. They understand a lot of, and this isn't all of our students, but just from the students that are that are from um, believe or parents that are believers, um, they know a lot and they have the right answers. Um, but it's coming to that, you know, humbling yourself and coming to that point where, yeah, I need the Lord and, and it's not, all my knowledge in, of the Bible that's going to save me. Um, it's what Christ has done. So I, there, I see that a lot because they're, they come from more affluent areas most of the time. Not always, but a lot of our students do. And then the other thing is if they've come through our school from grades one to nine and they haven't made a profession of faith or they haven't um, said that they've trusted the Lord, um, a lot of times I think the struggle is they're used to the routines of a Christian school and they know the staff are believers and things like that. And it's, again, it's easy to give that correct response. Uh, but I think what we as a staff are praying is that they see that their need goes beyond their knowledge. And we see that in the rural communities where it's not really the knowledge, but it's more uh, things that are preached in the communities are like just work-based salvation. And so if we do have um, students from those backgrounds, then that would be the challenge too. Um, just seeing it as um, Christ's work alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, do you take the students to the uh, local assemblies in the area and to the weekly Bible studies? And if so, how can we, how can we pray for, for, for that reach? Since they're there during the boarding school, um, there's some responsibility there. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Right. So most of the Bible teaching and education um, um, with Bible and um, it, it happens here on school property. We do have... Um, uh, staff members that do go out on a rotation basis um, into the community around and are part of the assemblies and in, in the rural community. Um, our students, there is one assembly that's close enough to walk to. And so our students, once, once a month, the older students from grades, I think it's five to grade nine, they will, what, what we do 
is called Walk to Church, and they go uh, with staff members, and they walk to church for that Sunday, and they go to, to the gospel meetings, and then they walk back to school. Um, so that happens on a regular basis, but our younger students are always on the property for Bible teaching and study. Um, what is nice about this is that we uh, staff members have the opportunity not only in classes but outside of the uh, classroom time periods to develop those relationships with students and open up their homes to have students come in for those personal um, small group bible studies and that does happen on a regular basis so in terms of prayer uh we would ask that that would be able to continue just in our climate now with COVID and everything, um, a lot of things have slowed down a bit, but it's been wonderful within the rural community what's been allowed to continue, and the Lord's just provided that way. Um, so we just pray for just continued open doors and um, just to seize each opportunity. Yeah. Very good. I was going to close just with asking, are there any personal prayer requests that you could share with us or just general uh, so that we can know how to pray best for you, Ruth? Well, thank you very much. Um, well, it's a season of change in my life right now. Um, the Lord has uh, provided uh, someone um, to share the work with me here. And so we're planning to be married and next year. And um, it's, it's a blessing, but it's also a big change. And uh, our heart is definitely for the school and these um, students. But there's definitely some... Uh, uh, teaching methodology, things that need to continue on in order to be most effective here at the school. So we are planning to take a bit of a furlough in that. And so just the Lord's wisdom um, moving forward in that way. But then at the school, we're just asking for prayer um, for teach more teaching staff on long-term or short-term basis. We're just asking the Lord to, to provide in that way, specifically for next year, as um, I will be going for a bit and um, one other staff member. And so uh, just... The Lord's leading and guiding and just being sensitive to that. Um, yes. So thank you. Yes. Thank you for, for sharing uh, the ministry and your heart. And uh, certainly um, we will be praying for you. So be encouraged. Um, and thank, thank you. you today for joining our call. You're welcome to stay with us. We're going to move now from Zambia and we're going to move over to the country of Tanzania. And we want to welcome uh, John and Jennifer Kinlaw. I don't see their children, but we do remember Isaac and Elena, Samuel, and Katie uh, in our prayers. They're found day three in your handbook, page 19. So we welcome you, uh, John and Jennifer. Say hello to the group in, in the room here. Hi. Hey, everybody. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very <No>. good <laughs> oh, sure. we tried to make it interactive and um so the the uh the, the first question i had um we thank you for sharing about the reading room um and uh, can you show, tell us about the reading room a little more its materials and the outreach to the muslim village yeah um well, we live in Kigoma, which is a sister town. I guess Ujiji would be more like a small town than a village, but I call it a village. It's uh, really old and has a lot of history. It's where David Livingston uh, was found by Henry Stanley. And um, so they have a Livingston Museum there, but it's a, it's a all Muslim uh, town, village. Um, and after being in Kigoma a short time, uh, just praying, uh, about how the Lord would would use us, um, He just clearly led led me up there and wanted to kind of uh, really plant an outpost there in that village and um, get to know the people. And uh, yeah, so we opened, we rented this little room right in the main um, um, intersection there, and. Um, so the books, there's a there's a publishing company, uh, Kanisa La Biblia, has a publisher a publishing company, and so they translate a lot of books. Like they're translating uh, William McDonald's Believer's Commentary. There's a lot of commentaries in Swahili from Don Fleming. Um, we even have um, uh, David Gooding in there. There's um, uh, a lot of other names that are familiar, and then unfamiliar names, but. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of good books. Over a hundred uh, different uh, <coughs> Christian commentaries and and books on Christian living and worship and so forth. 
and um, yeah, also section books. For Muslims. Yeah, section for Muslims. Um, how to reach Muslims, how to, uh, for the Tanzanian and Swahili, but also books for Muslims to understand the Bible, understand the gospel. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, the Maktaba is called the Maktaba in Swahili. It means library, but it's, uh, it's really neat. It's just um, a neat place. We show the King of Glory each afternoon and the kids come after school and, and watch. Uh, and um you know, there's a fine line there. If we were to teach in the mock in this reading room, then we would have a problem, and uh, we would probably be not uh, able to renew our lease there. So we kind of have to let the video teach, <laughs> but uh, know our boundaries there. Um, uh, but um, so we function as a library. Uh, pastors from Kigoma come over and. Uh, check out books. Um, Muslims, yeah, uh, Muslims check out books uh, out of curiosity, and um, we have Emmaus courses. Um, so we have right now about uh, maybe 15 to 20 students that are going through the Emmaus courses in Swahili, and we just had our first uh, student, uh, which was in the video there, uh, who finished the whole 40-some courses, and uh, his name's Riziki, so... Um, but uh, other than that, um, it's just a place where people come. We have uh, some guys from the mosque that come and want to ask questions and discuss things. So, mm -hmm. Very good. Could you tell us a little more about the, um, the outreach with the street boys and uh, in the schools? Yeah, well, the Street Boys was really fun. Uh, after about two years, it kind of dissolved. You know, the guys, it was like we had a window there. Um, well, we um, came back last summer because of COVID, and it was our first little furlough, and we thought, okay, this will be a really good time for the kids to see their grandparents, and it ended up being just a phenomenal time. Um, one of our kids got saved during that time on furlough. We had some really great time with um, John's mother, who now is dying. Um, but when we returned, then that work had dissolved and the street boys had pretty much scattered. They had just gone back to different villages they were from. Um, and after really praying about it, when we got back, we just realized that that particular ministry was for a season. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah you know those guys when we first started meeting none of them would admit they had sinned you know mm -hmm. so it was really cool by the the end of that that time all of them would agree with the gospel at least outwardly you know you don't know their hearts but they had really you know come to embrace the truths of the gospel i don't i didn't see any of them get saved but anyway mm -hmm. Um, the this, this schools is really cool. The, in Tanzania, the government schools are open one day a week uh, for one hour to teach. Uh, it's a religious class, so either the, someone from the mosque or someone from the church can come. They divide, the, um, they divide like the Christian kids and the Muslim kids. Um, so usually you're speaking to um, kids from Christian homes, but you realize that many of those probably don't truly know the Lord. Um, and I think they're up to three schools now. So yeah. they have about probably 150 ish students a week that yeah. they just have free, they have an hour with. But I'd also add that the Muslim kids don't have anyone teaching them. So they come to the windows or they take their, yeah. their hijab off and they, they sneak in. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So I guess we would allow that. Could you tell us, how, in your point of view, what's the best way to reach a Tanzanian Muslim? Mm, yeah, it's a great question. Relationships. Yeah, relationships, they're very relational. Mm -hmm. They are not time oriented like we are task oriented. They are people oriented. And uh, I think just being up there in Ujiji um, for these two, almost three years now, just I'm really starting to build relationships with, with some of our neighbors. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just relationships, just, just uh, sharing god's love and showing god's love to them um and just a lot of prayer because salvation mm. is of the lord man i mean it's just you realize mm. how ineffective you can be <laughs> when you get there but uh you need the lord to work in hearts so mm -hmm.
Hmm. Tell us a little bit um, in our closing questions here about your vision uh, to plant a youth camp and how we can we can pray for you in that regard. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and I realized, um, Stephen, where that original question, that video had been made like a year ago. So we're yeah. actually coming up on four years of being in Tanzania, mm -hmm. even though we're in the States right now. <clears throat> um, so that, jo that video jogged my mind, yeah. uh, memory. But um, last summer when we were here on furlough, we were just doing a lot of praying, just praying over things we mm -hmm. were struggling with, praying over, you know, how do we um, continue to handle the different cultural aspects of living in a country that's so very different than what you're used to. Um, also, we were just really praying, you know, Lord, what do you want us to continue to do? Like we knew he had uh, led in these various ministries, but we just felt like there was more. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, we didn't even know that the street boys ministry was going to fizzle out. So when we got back, though, very shortly after we got back, um, the Lord, through various uh, ways began to place on our hearts a desire to um, start a youth camp <laughs> and where we are you know it's just there there's no concept of it so there is some camp ministry in other parts of the country closer to the big city but we're on the other side of the country and just where it's very poor so uh, we were very um, not nervous but I don't know we we've both been involved in Christian camp work a lot but it's a whole nother thing when you're thinking of starting a camp um so anyway we began to pray lord if this is you you just have to do it because we don't even know where to start um, and he very quickly began to confirm in very very clear ways um so we're really excited our biggest prayer with that right now is we've been searching for about a year and the lord knows uh for a location for the mm -hmm. camp so um he's already started providing just that was another very clear thing we didn't expect but um we're just really praying about where he wants this camp to be located does he want it to be in ujiji which is what we originally kind of thought or hoped or would he rather it be a little bit more in the villages so uh, we're really excited about all the ways the lord can use um, a youth camp in in our area praise the lord thank you for sharing but before we let you go uh, do you have any general uh, prayer requests or anything personal we could pray for uh, regarding uh, both you, the kids, and the work, um, and your return? Yeah, so we have a big praise. So my mom, my, my dad died uh, in 2000 from cancer, and he was a believer. And then after he died, a few months later, I got saved. So uh, then my sister got saved. I have one sister. Um, one sibling. So my sister and I have been the only believers in our family. In a large family. Large family. Uh, and this past Sunday night, my mom, who's dying of cancer, uh, trusted Christ as her Savior. It was just incredible. Aww. Just broken, weeping, Aww. and uh, said, I need to be saved. I don't know why I've been stubborn for so long. Mm -hmm. It was Aww. like, oh, just amazing. Aww. So <clears throat> that's why we're here. We're kind of walking her through this cancer journey. And uh, that, that was a game changer right there. So Because we really, yeah. she could pass away any day now. So we're just kind yeah. of, um, and it was interesting because after Sunday night, she was already really steadily declining health-wise. We had just found out last week that the tumors had gone all to her brain. Mm -hmm. But um, the day after she um got saved. It was very genuine, very clear. She, this week, she's just taken a very quick turn downward. So physically, so she knows she doesn't have many days left at all. So yeah. So praise. thank you for, for sharing your heart and, um, uh, and your ministry and, and those family concerns. And certainly our prayers are with your children, Isaac, Elena, yeah. Samuel, and Katie. And we just appreciate you, you, you sharing and, and, and joining with us today. We are, uh, we are going to shift from um, Tanzania. We're going to move to Nigeria, and we want to welcome Stephen Patty Phillips. Say hi so we can test your audio. You're still on mute, but just uh, say hi to the group. You're still on mute there, Stephen. There you go. Okay. Hi. Good. Hello. <laughs> Greetings to all of you. 
Very good. It's so nice that you're joining us. I know you're in another room in the building, and uh, but we're going to ask you some questions. Appreciate uh, your ministry and what you've um, shared already on the video. So one question uh, that came up is, has the Bible been translated into, into most of the many dialects that you mentioned in your video in Nigeria? No, it has not. There are approximately 500 dialects. English is the official language of Nigeria, and the literacy is approximately 60%. There are three primary dialects, Hausa in the north, Yoruba in the southwest, and Igbo in the southeast. Bibles have been translated into those three major dialects, as well as many other minor dialects throughout the country. But this is a great need for those that have a burden to see the word of God into local languages. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to shift a little bit to um, kind of a more of a curious question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Pentecostals uh, in Nigeria. And um, the curious question is Pentecostals in the West are not as, as adamant as um, portrayed in um, Nigeria. So I guess the curious question is uh, why, why are they um, take a stance against evangelical Christians in this sense? in Nigeria, what's the source of that? The primary reason is because the word of God is not taught in the Pentecostal churches. What they are looking after is an encounter, a spiritual experience, and it's mixed in with African traditional religion. In the local culture, positive confession forms the backbone of all of their animistic beliefs, which in essence means that ritual words spoken according to formula have mm. the ability to transform reality. So in the Pentecostal churches, they're not looking for Bible teaching. They're not, I don't hear the gospel being preached. Mm. I've been to 20 states in the Federation I've spoken in virtually all different denominations within the country. And in those settings, I don't hear the gospel. I don't hear the word of God. And so their main concern is to gain power over evil influences that will hold back their progress toward personal prosperity. So when the word of God comes into the midst of that, that erodes their whole foundation, both culturally and religiously. So we've gotten some extreme reactions to simply teaching what the word of God says. And as Patty mentioned in the video, I've received death threats uh, more than once, simply because of the word of God being exposed. Hmm. Thank you for sharing. Can we shift a little bit and ask um, a similar question that I, I had asked John? What's the best way to reach a Nigerian Muslim? And perhaps you could share a little bit about um, the dreams um, and visions, perhaps, that these Nigerian Muslims are experiencing in their, in their context. The best way to reach Muslims, Nigeria or anywhere, is simply with love mm -hmm. and with kindness and respect and forthright declaration of truth in love with extreme patience. Coupled with that is an understanding of the Muslim mind, what they believe about certain things that we take for granted. For example, if I say, Jesus is the Son of God who died for your sins. I've already committed horrible blasphemies mm -hmm. because in their mind, Jesus being Son of God means that the Father had physical relationships with Mary. But in our minds, it means something altogether different. So if we don't understand some of these differences in their thinking, we can actually commit gross offenses unawares 
So it's good to understand the Muslim culture, their thinking, their definitions about various terms that perhaps we have a completely defin uh, different definition for. Mm -hmm. And the dreams, I believe, are a result of the failure of the church to live godly, responsibly, and biblically, and lovingly among one another. So as the Muslim looks at the church, he sees people running after money, um, doing wild speaking in tongues with no interpretation. And the question that arises in a Muslim mind is, why would I risk my life to join that? Mm. And so there's little motivation for a Muslim within the Nigerian context to identify with the church and suffer the resulting persecution. So in my estimation, Jesus Christ, who loves these people, has circumvented the people that are causing his name to be blasphemed, and he's encountering them directly through visions and dreams and angelic visitations. And in fact, I can't think of a single Muslim that I know of in Nigeria that has been converted apart from what we might call a direct supernatural encounter. Wow, wow. Let's shift a little bit and ask about the, uh, the, the radio programs that you conduct, um, it, the preparation time for that and uh, its outreach in the country. We have created our own makeshift uh, recording booth in a closet in our house. We've gotten some foam mattresses, and so we made ourselves a sound booth. So three of us crowd into this thing with the laptop, and we have a software recording program named Audacity. We use that, and we record afterwards. I edit to make sure there's no gaps and stumbling and that type of thing. Then we send it via Google Drive to four different stations in different places in Nigeria. And that is how we go about it. it. The quality actually is very good and all the stations uh, approve and applaud what we've done. And as far as the outreach, it, it, the stations themselves tell us that we have a listenership of more than 20 million people every single Sunday. We broadcast in English and Yoruba in the Southwest, English and Igala in Kogi State, English and Idoma in Benue State where we live. And we do an all English, a kind of a talk show host type interactive Bible teaching in Abuja, the capital, all English, because that's the most cosmopolitan city in the country. So what we do on every station is we have a phone number with a brother that I have discipled over the years who answers the questions that listeners may have. They meet with them personally. And in those personal meetings, they're able to answer their questions <clears throat> and begin a, dis <clears throat> a discipleship process with them. Many of them have joined right. local assemblies. I'll mute there. Yeah. Are we still there? Yeah, we're still there. No worries. Okay. Keep going, Steve. Many of them have joined in local assemblies and others have gone into their local areas and various villages to carry on the work of the gospel and discipleship in their own areas. So we're really encouraged by these responses. Praise the Lord. As we, as we round out our, our questioning with you, uh, Steve and Patty, perhaps you can uh, tell us a little bit about the effective ways of reaching out to the Nigerian women that you mentioned also in the video. The women are personal. They watch you. Mm. They wanna see what kind of person you are. And so we just 
keep faithful to the Lord and be honest and loving and straightforward with them. I meet most of them at the market in the village and I love them and they know that. In fact, even the men, the Okada drivers, that's like little motorcycle taxis. They love me and they see me come by every time and they want me to hand them the tracks or now I need a book, you know, I've had so many tracks and I want to know more. And like one of the women to go, give me money. They don't want the track, they want money. So I said, well, let me buy what you have here. Well, it was their local rice with rocks in it and I could not eat it, but I bought it from them. And then one of the other ladies, give it to me. So I gave it to her. I said, let's not do this again. I'm not here to just give money. I'm here to give eternal life. And that lady greets me every time. And she doesn't, she's not mad that I won't give her money, but mm -hmm. she knows that I love her and I want something more than just money for her. Mm -hmm. And so my friend Rachel works with me there. She, we reach the children also, but she goes shopping with me every time. And we both can talk to people. Um, one Muslim lady, she hugs me and says, I love you. And I know God. Well, I find out she's Muslim. And I tell her, Jesus Christ is the one you need. And so you just have to be real. You have to be concerned about them. And they love it when I try to learn their language. <laughs> There's more than one there in the market. And uh, so I've had Bible studies with some. We... Uh, You're doing something with the ladies and discipling some ladies and yeah. sharing the word of God yeah. with them, right? Right. So we overview the different topics, like I'm doing key women in the Bible. And we're learning to be overcomers the way those like Sarah and mm -hmm. all of them. I started with Eve and I'm all the way at the end of the Old Testament. So we go over each one and then we go through the word of God, how it relates to them. And then we try to discern what God's really trying to say together, not just me speaking at them. And then mm -hmm. I ask them heart searching questions and how it all relates to us. And they're just being able to express those things so that they can understand what God wants of them. And it's just yeah. wonderful. Praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing that. As we close our, our, our time with you, are there any personal prayer requests or general prayer requests you'd like to share with the group? Jeremiah 33.3 3 has been on my mind for many months now. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. And we believe that we are at a juncture for a new phase of our ministry, but we don't know what it is. So that's our prayer. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that. I'm going to um, let all you missionaries see the group in the room. So if everyone just could wave, don't make me too much. Uh, there you go. Everyone wave. Hi. Just so you know how large of a class we've had. And uh, so that, um, that you see um, who is in our room today. So I'm going to close in prayer, if that's okay. And then we will we'll end our session. I just want to thank thank you, Ruth, for joining. I'm glad the electricity didn't go out where you are. <laughs> yes, uh, John and Jennifer, thank you for joining and sharing your heart. And uh, Steve and Patty, thank you for sharing your ministry and uh, your concern. And everyone else who joined us, uh, not only in the room but online, just thank you for sharing and continuing to um, support and to pray for the work in Africa. So let's just close in prayer together. Lord, thank you uh, for this time together, Lord. We rejoice in what you are doing in the past in on the continent of Africa, what you are doing in the present and what you will do in the future. And thank you for these missionaries that are represented. Thank you for Ruth, Lord, and her ministry in Zambia. Just pray for her, bless her, her plans, encourage her, Lord, help her to know your presence there and meet her needs. Lord, thank you for John and Jennifer, Lord, and their ministry, their family. Lord, thank you for answering prayer concerning their family, Lord. We rejoice with them, Lord, in this. And we just pray that you would give them vision 
and encouragement, Lord, as they plan to return. Bless Steve and Patty, Lord. Encourage them, Lord. Thank you that they're here at the conference with us and encourage them, their plans and their burdens, Lord, for the people of Nigeria. So, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. Thank you for your goodness to us. And we ask all these requests. We give thanks in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone, for joining. What time is it in where she is? Ah, that's a good question. We're going to go off script there, Ruth. Can you tell us what time it is where you are? It is about 7.20 in the evening. <laughs> in the evening. Yeah. Yeah, p.m. p.m. Yes, thank you. And we, yeah. I think we, we stayed on task, didn't we? Like your sticker says. You did great. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very good. All right, yeah. everyone. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and your evening. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be seeing you soon. Yes. Thank you.